It's 11 a.m. on February 24th, 2022. A fleet of tanks, trucks, armored personnel carriers, and other vehicles are departing from the southern tier of Belarus. About six hours earlier, Vladimir Putin went on Russian national television to deliver an address that announced the start of a special military operation against Ukraine. The fleet leaving Belarus represented the main component of Russia's offensive against Kyiv, the Ukrainian capital. What followed on its tail would later become known as the Russian Kyiv Convoy, at one point stretching 64 kilometers and representing the inevitable end of the Ukrainian state. Pockets of fighting were already active around Kyiv, with Ukrainian President Zelensky organizing what seemed like the final stand against the Russian invasion. With the battle on his doorstep, Western partners offered to evacuate Zelensky to safer grounds so that he could start a government in exile. His response, at least as the Ukrainian embassy in the United Kingdom tells it, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. However, to outside observers, including the U.S. intelligence community, it appeared that what Ukraine really needed was not ammunition. It was a miracle. At the time, Russia was the consensus pick for the second or third greatest military power in the world. Ukrainian strength was a drop in the bucket by comparison. They were massively outgunned, and the convoy was only 150 kilometers away from the capital, a distance that you or I could drive in less than two hours under peaceful circumstances. And while the circumstances that day were anything but peaceful, Russian strategic planners had set midnight as the latest time that Russian troops should reach the capital, and three days until the battle was over. U.S. estimates suggested that it might take a few more, but such a distinction hardly put any Ukrainian minds at ease. However, Ukraine would survive the first day, then the second day, then a week. By March 11th, the dreaded convoy had dispersed, apparently more interested in taking cover than taking Kyiv. By March 16th, Ukraine would begin a true counterattack. By March 29th, Russia would announce its plan to depart from the area, ending the Western offensive entirely. But this was no miracle. It was the combination of Ukrainian ingenuity and Russian missteps that prevented Moscow from achieving its goal. This is the story of the Battle of Kyiv. Act 1. Russia's Mobilization Speaking about the 2003 Iraq War, U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld famously quipped that, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you might want. Rumsfeld was right in the broadest sense. A country cannot magically will nuclear weapons into existence as much as it might wish. However, that sentiment understates the amount of control that a country's leadership has over the effort that they and their population exert in a conflict. As a starting point, you can go with low effort, like the Tomahawk Cruise Missile Campaign and No-Fly Zone that NATO established over Libya during the 2011 Civil War. Then there is medium effort, like in the Iraq War that Rumsfeld oversaw, where the United States actually put boots on the ground. You could escalate to high effort, like during the Vietnam War, when the United States had to establish a draft to keep the effort going. And then there is the all-in wartime economy strategy, like World War II, where basically everyone's labor, even those not historically involved in fighting, is somehow eventually connected to the broader war effort. Toward the end of 2021, deep inside the halls of the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin was thinking about where to place Russia on this spectrum. Military mobilizations are political decisions that come with costs and benefits. The obvious benefit is that the more you mobilize, the more likely you are to win a conflict. In the current sense, that would mean a higher chance that more of Ukraine would fall into Russian hands. The downside is that the more you mobilize, the greater the cost you incur to do so. This is because you have to recruit and pay those additional soldiers, your economy will be gutted and then further gutted, and you are more likely to face political challengers. 
and especially in the case of an autocratic regime like Russia's, that means a higher chance of an untimely death for its leader. At the very least, you have to start thinking twice about whether any guard with a gun has perhaps smuggled in a bullet or two. Overall, the goal is to find the mobilization level, where the extra chance of victory is exactly offset by the additional economic costs and political risks. At that point, by definition, you are doing the best you can given the circumstances. Putin, it turns out, calculated that a modest mobilization was his best choice. Factors on both sides of the equation led to that conclusion. On the military side, as we have discussed before, Putin was under the impression that Russian soldiers were ready and that their equipment was top-notch. He also believed that a sizable portion of Ukrainians would not even bother resisting in the first place. Anticipating that, Zelensky might leave Ukraine while he was still alive and still wearing suits and ties. Just six months earlier, something like that had happened in Kabul, when Afghanistan's president Ashraf Ghani fled the capital. Other Afghan officials, and many that the U.S. had thought were committed to the Afghan government, treated this as a signal. Like dominoes, they all fell down. The government disappeared without a real fight. Ukrainians were intimately familiar with such an experience. Eight years before the Russian invasion, Viktor Yanukovych fled to Russia in exile, rather than challenge protesters during the Maidan Revolution. If Ukraine in 2022 were anything like Afghanistan in 2021, or Ukraine in 2014, selecting a large mobilization would be overkill for Russia. Even if the war itself were short, the commotion it would cause in Moscow would be an unnecessary headache. Putin was also constrained by how every unit of mobilization would impose a sharp cost. It is easy to use the word autocrat to shorthand the Russian leader's position. But life for Putin was different than the experiences of Joseph Stalin, Saddam Hussein, or Kim Jong-un. Unlike in those other places, there were some real institutional constraints in Moscow. They may have been weak, certainly weaker than those found in the West, but each was still something that Putin had to navigate through. And in this particular case, it was arguably central to the whole social contract that kept the Kremlin afloat. Between revisions to the Constitution and degradation of public agencies, Russians were aware that Putin had steadily eroded democratic institutions since he came to power on December 31st, 1999. But the implicit bargain was that Putin was free to pursue his own agenda, especially on the international stage, so long as the economy was booming and his foreign affairs were not affecting the average Alexanders. In fact, part of Putin's popularity stemmed from reforms in this exact area. Russia shifted from a system with two years mandatory conscription to half that, with only a third of those eligible ultimately serving. By 2019, Moscow had declared its intention to end conscription altogether and move to a professional military. This is, in part, why the war in Donbass up until 2022 looked the way that it did. Rather than engage in a traditional invasion, Russia sent unmarked men, missing the proper flags on their arms, into eastern Ukraine to foment a separatist movement. More generally, Putin faced a problem with mobilizing any of the conscripted men to Ukraine, their service is intended to stay in Russia. In other words, Putin's sensitivity on the political risk meter was higher than what a casual analysis might suggest. This is how we ended up with the announcement of, not a war, but rather a special military operation. A war would have a more specific legal meaning and raise more alarm bells across the country. It is also why Russia's initial invasion had a shortfall of troops given basic rules of thumb. Ukraine was expected to have 200,000 troops to defend against that initial invasion. Russia ultimately mobilized about the same quantity. However, all else equal, 
Russian military planners would have known that attacking troops needed about a 3 to 1 numerical superiority to overcome the advantages that defenders have. Given that recommendation, Russia should have instead mobilized 600,000 soldiers. None of this is to say that a larger mobilization was impossible for Putin. Far from it. Indeed, with this September 21st, 2022 announcement, Moscow would eventually begin taking those steps as a result of Ukraine successfully executing numerous counterattacks. But any additional mobilization quantities at the start of the war would have come with more political risks. And from Putin's perspective, what was the point? His military was strong, and Ukraine's resolve was weak. Russian victory and Ukrainian defeat were already exceptionally likely. Further effort would have only had marginal impact. Act 2. Operational Secrecy Putin was committed to starting the war, but he was not about to make that desire public, especially to the West. That is because there was disagreement within Western leadership regarding the seriousness of the threat. The United States, the United Kingdom, and the Baltic states were convinced that Russia was about to make a move. In contrast, Ukraine believed that Russia's implicit threats were not inherently credible. Germany and France were sympathetic with that position. The latter two countries still felt burned from the 2003 Iraq War, when U.S. intelligence officials far overplayed their hands, claiming confidence about Saddam Hussein's alleged weapons of mass destruction program that went far beyond what the true evidence indicated. That, of course, was primarily the Bush administration's fault. Obama, Trump, and Biden had resided in the West Wing in the meantime, but 2021 had created a new source of doubt for the European powers. The United States had insisted that Afghanistan's government would hold for a reasonable period of time after the American withdrawal. Instead, it seemingly evaporated overnight. France and Germany were left to wonder what made the accuracy of this U.S. intelligence report any different. For Putin, the goal was to keep the diplomatic charade going for as long as he could. Although he was optimistic that Europe's ultimate response would be fewer embraces and more slaps on the wrist, he wanted to delay any trouble for as long as he could. Moreover, if Russia's military figured out a way to achieve a lightning victory, there would be little the West could do regardless, much as what happened after Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea. And the secrecy plot worked, even very late into the game. Despite U.S. intelligence leaking Russia's next moves on a regular basis, there was still no consensus in the West about what would happen in the days to come. France in particular worked hard to bridge the negotiations, with President Emmanuel Macron traveling to Moscow on February 7th, widely noted in the media for the exceptionally long table situated between him and Putin. Macron's efforts continued two weeks later, when he called Putin on February 20th for a final shot at diplomacy. By the end of the conversation, Macron was convinced that Putin still sought a diplomatic solution. Even though Putin ended the phone call early, so he could head to the ice and work on his slap shot. The next day, Putin would trade in his skates for a pen, and with a couple of strokes, he would officially recognize the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk. And three days after that, diplomacy would end and the special military operation would begin. Unfortunately for Russia's military planners, keeping the secret for this long meant accepting some serious trade-offs in organizing the invasion. It is possible that even very senior Russian officials were kept in the dark about Putin's plans until the last moments. Hoping to deter the Kremlin, on November 2, 2021, Biden dispatched CIA Director William Burns to Moscow. The plan was to warn Russian officials that the United States was prepared to respond to the invasion of Ukraine. One of Burns's many meetings was with the Secretary of the Russian Security Council, Nikolai Patrushev, considered to be one of the frontrunners to take control of Russia, should Putin ever step down. After rattling off the potential consequences that Washington was prepared to implement should Russia invade Ukraine, Patrushev just responded in shock. 
Obviously, it is possible that Patrushev was in on the plan, and instead was looking to win a Best Acting Award. But that was not Burns' takeaway. No. Burns' impression was that Putin had not mentioned any of this to Patrushev, and that Patrushev was having to process Burns' spoiler alert in real time. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken had a similar experience. In January, Blinken toured Europe with the lingering war on his mind. His first stop on the 19th was to Kyiv to meet with his Ukrainian counterpart. After a brief stop in Germany, it was back on his plane to fly to Geneva. There, he would meet with Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs Sergei Lavrov on the 21st. For 90 minutes, Blinken pressed for answers regarding Russia's intentions. Lavrov talked in circles. Blinken left the meeting uncertain which of the two diplomats was better informed about what Putin actually wanted. Behind the scenes, Putin's goals were ambitious. The FSB, one of Russia's many security agencies, eyed two potential puppet governments should Kyiv fall. Remember Viktor Yanukovych? the fallen Ukrainian president who had fled to Russia in 2014? On March 7th, his plane would fly to Belarus, apparently in place to go back to Kyiv, so he could stake a claim as the legitimate leader of Ukraine. A second group formed in southeast Ukraine, which included Oleg Zarev. Zarev was a former member of the Ukrainian Rada. Post-Maidan revolution, he led the brief New Russia Movement, which sought to create a confederacy of Luhansk, Donetsk, and other Ukrainian separatist regions that failed to arise. However, none of this appears to have filtered down to the Russian troops who would be responsible for implementing all of it. Under the impression that they were in Belarus for training exercises, Russian troops had little reason to depart from the traditional corruption that plagues their ranks. A well-functioning tank is important if you think you are about to enter hostile territory. But when you don't think that, it is also full of copper wiring, diesel, and other resources that would fetch good money on the black market. And just like that, millions of dollars in equipment would become worthless because a Russian soldier just wanted a few bucks to buy some vodka. After all, what is a vacation in Belarus if you can't drink a little? Eventually, high-level Russian leadership had to tell the soldiers what was happening. But for many, the forewarning was between 24 hours and just one hour, not enough time to undo all of the damage. The lack of preparation showed. Some soldiers were given simple instructions. Follow the vehicle in front of you, and you will reach the capital as early as mid-afternoon. Contingency plans, for example, what happens when one of those vehicles breaks down or blows up, were not outlined. And rather than receiving the world's most advanced military technology, soldiers lacked even the basic tools of the trade. Wikipedia was the source of instructions for a weapon found on one of Russia's lost soldiers. Outdated maps of Ukraine hearkening back to the 1960s were discovered on others, which in retrospect actually seems fitting given the goal of returning Kyiv to Moscow's control. Near Chernobyl, Russian troops marched through the Red Forest, so named because of the color the trees turned to after absorbing radiation. Worse yet, there are indications that they dug trenches in the area, exposing themselves to radiation still contained in the ground. Without dedicated lines of radio communications, soldiers used their own cell phones, giving away their locations to their enemy. Medics received an undersupply of provisions, perhaps linked to expectations that the war would be easy and that everyone should pack their dress uniforms instead. At a higher level, Russia could not conduct a shock and awe campaign in the style that the United States did before the Iraq War. This would have softened up Ukrainian countermeasures, but it also would have delayed the expected time between the start of kinetic efforts and the capture of Kyiv. In the meantime, it would have given all the clarity France and Germany needed to verify Russian intentions, and from there, Western countermeasures would have begun. Meanwhile, Russian troops could not simply stay in Belarus forever. The claim that they were conducting exercises would ring hollow as days turned to weeks turned to months. <laughs>
This was also the second time that Russia had mobilized to Belarus, after having sent tens of thousands of troops there in the winter and spring of 2021. A third round of mobilization would raise further suspicions. All told, this was just the military that Russia had available for the task. Putin had made his bed. Now it was time for him to lie in it. Interlude The Ticking Time Bomb By outward appearances, Ukraine was outgunned. But inside Kyiv, there was still a sliver of hope. As this channel has covered before, in the weeks prior to the war, as Russia was mobilizing for something, Ukraine covertly dispatched intelligence agents across the border to examine Russia's preparation. They found drunk units with rusting tanks. The deployed Russians acted more like scrap heap salesmen and less like soldiers. None of this was shocking. Before the 2022 crisis, Russian military corruption and morale problems were open secrets. In 2007, Putin appointed Anatoly Serdyukov to Minister of Defense, asking him to fix the system. To give you an idea of the bureaucratic nature of the problem, Serdyukov's background was in the federal tax service, not the military. And the taxman's job only received greater attention following the Russo-Georgian War of 2008. Despite Russia emerging victorious in its goal of securing autonomy for Abkhazia and South Ossetia, post-war analysis showed that Russia had underperformed, both in its coordination of its soldiers and maintenance of its equipment. Fittingly, the taxman engaged in sketchy property deals on the side. The reform seemed to have some serious cracks in its implementation. Back in 2022, following the intel gathering missions, Ukraine had a better idea about how Russia never really resolved its corruption problem. This was also consistent with the United States' intelligence assessment, that Moscow's broader plans were not reaching Russian soldiers on the ground. All told, this meant that Kyiv had strong suspicions that Russia's invasion force was a ticking time bomb. But rather than being one about to explode on the capital, it was ticking down to its own self-destruction. All Ukraine needed to do to have a fighting chance in the war was survive the first 72 hours. At that point, Russian soldiers would begin running out of food and fuel. Equipment would start breaking down. And without any contingency plans in place, most of the special military operation would begin to flail around. Ukraine would not be guaranteed to win the war, nor could Kyiv be assured about anything happening on its eastern borders. But at the very least, the Ukrainian government would continue to function. Act 3. Ukraine's Game Plan Surviving for long enough for Russia's ticking time bomb to go off required that Ukraine complete five separate tasks keep Zelensky alive and in the country, prevent Russia from establishing a sky bridge into Kyiv, render the Russian air force ineffective, repel the initial attack on the capital, and make the convoy regret ever having crossed the Belarusian border. Of these, keeping Zelensky alive and in the country was the easiest, and the in the country part was a gimme. All Zelensky had to do was refuse any plane, train, or automobile that the West was offering, Nevertheless, it took a calculated gamble. The rest of Ukraine's plan was far from a guaranteed success. And should Ukraine fail, it would grow increasingly difficult for Zelensky to flee. That would jeopardize the continuity of government and facilitate the appointment of a Russian proxy to the presidency. As Zelensky awoke in the middle of the night to the invasion underway, his initial task was to meet with defense ministers to address where he should go. They reached a consensus. Zelensky would stay in Kyiv. Doing so would raise Ukraine's rally-round-the-flag effect and convince others to stay and fight as well. The higher chances of success justified the higher risks. However, keeping Zelensky alive required more strategy. Even if Ukraine could militarily win the Battle of Kyiv, he still had to worry about assassination attempts on the ground and from the sky. The ground part was the bigger concern. It was a major component of CIA Director Burns' message to Zelensky, warning the president of specific plots that Russia might use. 
U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris would reiterate those warnings to Zelensky at the Munich Security Conference, just a few days prior to the invasion. It wasn't just the possibility that Russia might drop special forces into Kyiv to specifically target Zelensky. Defections would also be a recurring problem across the country. If a single person within Zelensky's own security service turned, Russia could take down the president from the inside. Ukraine therefore retooled its protection assignments. Only those whose loyalty was unquestionable could get near Zelensky while armed. Of course, that would not stop Moscow from raining bombs from above to accomplish the same goal. But ironically, Moscow had sabotaged that plan decades earlier. Much of Kyiv's infrastructure is a byproduct of Cold War planning. Across the country, subway tunnels that are normally meant for trains were built deeper underground to double as nuclear fallout shelters. During the initial stages of the invasion, civilians jammed inside them for safety. But the office of the president had an even better option. A large bunker system under Kyiv, specifically designed to keep the government functioning from below. Those who have been in the bunker tunnels describe them as so vast and disorienting that even if you knew where Zelensky was within them, you would still have a hard time navigating your way there. When it was safe, Zelensky would pop out every now and then to rally the troops and verify that he was still alive. But the bunker network effectively guaranteed his safety. And just like that, Ukraine had foiled one of the critical aspects of Russia's invasion plans. The first goal was complete. The second task was to prevent Russia from establishing a sky bridge to Kyiv. That 150 kilometers on the ground might not seem like much to drive, but even under good conditions, simply flying everything directly to the combat zone makes life a lot easier for the invader. We have discussed the main effort here before, so I will keep this part brief. Russia's central goal was to target the Hostomol airport, just a 38-kilometer drive from the capital's center. You might remember it as the home of the former AN-225, the world's largest plane before it got destroyed in the invasion. During peacetime, the airport served as a freight station. Its long runways, normally meant to accommodate heavy cargo liners like the AN-225, were ideal for landing heavy military equipment. Burns had also warned Zelensky about the importance of the airport, so Ukraine was prepared to respond. As a preliminary measure, Ukraine parked long vehicles perpendicular to the runway, including this, likely a snowplow. Doing so prevented Russia from simply landing planes until soldiers had arrived, secured the location, and removed the obstructions. Russia airdropped soldiers around the airport within a few hours of the invasion. They would quickly take control over the facility. However, Ukrainians were waiting in reserve for a counterattack, and Russia had to retreat to the surrounding woods for the night. The next day, Russian reinforcements arrived on the ground and overwhelmed Ukrainian defenders. The airport exchanged hands once again, and Russia began clearing the obstacles. Nevertheless, in the interim, Ukraine hit the runway with enough bombs and artillery to render it inoperable. Russia would later repair the runway and begin receiving planes, but not quickly enough to have it make an impact on the outcome of the overall offensive. Ukraine was two for two with its goals thus far. The third task was to stop the Russian Air Force more generally. Ukraine succeeded here due to a combination of Russian rigidity, Ukrainian foresight, and a little help from some friends. In the months prior to the war, Ukraine dispersed its anti-aircraft systems as a preliminary step toward creating a more robust defense network, fully aware that Russia would want to target them to clear a path for its planes. And in the days before the actual invasion, Ukraine further reshuffled many of its systems. And they kept reshuffling. As a result, the majority of Russia's first wave of strikes missed, instead hitting the former locations. Briefly, Russian pilots were under the false impression that the opening strikes were an unmitigated success and flew without caution. Ukraine was all too happy to treat that period as open season, 
Russian intelligence soon picked up on the fact that the initial strikes had missed, and located where Ukraine had moved some of the systems. However, the excessively bureaucratic nature of the Russian military meant that 48 or 72 hours might pass between acquisition of the intelligence and the actual attack. As such, as long as Ukraine kept cycling locations, the anti-aircraft systems could stay mostly intact. Despite having an inferior air force with substantially worse range, Ukrainian planes also got into the act. Ukraine noticed that many Russian bombers would fly solo, without anti-aircraft fighter jets acting as chaperones. The Ukrainian pilots discovered that they could fly their ostensibly inferior planes low to the ground, hidden from Russian radar, and ambush Russian bombers. Russia eventually got wise to Ukraine's counterplay. The counter-counterplay was to fly Russian bombers low as well, also preventing Ukrainian radar from detecting them. However, Ukraine was ready with a counter-counter-counterplay. Low-flying aircraft are vulnerable to Man-Portable Air Defense Systems, or MANPADS for short. In January 2022, Zelensky found a windfall of MANPADS from the United States and Europe. And now Ukraine had trapped the Russian planes in a place where Ukraine could put the systems to their full use. As a result, what appeared to be a clear aircraft advantage to Russia, at least on paper, ended up being manageable for Ukraine. Kyiv was three for three. Still, Ukraine's most difficult tasks were yet to come. The preliminary phase was stopping the oncoming Russian soldiers. In broad strokes, Ukraine divided the workflow in two, setting up an outer ring and an inner ring of defense around the city. The purpose of the inner ring was to serve as the final stand, where Ukraine could take the battle to the streets, in case all else failed. However, having observed the fate of Grozny after the Chechen Wars, Ukraine was familiar with what Russian artillery and armored columns could do from short range. The outer ring, placed in the suburbs, was meant to keep Kyiv's downtown economic hub outside of the damage radius. Ukrainian defenders on the outer ring had another strategic advantage. Russia had split its attack. There was the Kyiv front, which has occupied all of our attention thus far. But some of the 200,000 Russian invaders were east on the Donbass front, and yet more of them were south on the Crimean front. Ukraine had to put up defenses at these other locations too, of course, but it meant that the initially outnumbered Ukrainian forces did not have to bear the full weight of Russia's attack. One of the first orders of business was to shift the force ratios in favor of Ukraine. The government opened up its armories, inviting average Ukrainian citizens to take military-grade arms. It also made for a more powerful territorial defense force, Ukraine's official reserve system. Meanwhile, regular civilians banded together to convert every empty bottle in the city into a Molotov cocktail, a fitting name given its historical legacy of resisting Russian invasions. These actions had two side benefits. First, had conventional Ukrainian defenses failed, Russia would have been stuck facing a well-armed insurgency. The United States knows all too well how that plays out, having experienced what happened in 2003 when Iraqi soldiers went home, still with their guns. Second, it would force low-level politicians to think twice about collaborating with Russia. Any mayor thinking about welcoming Russian troops had to worry that dozens of their neighbors might arrive at City Hall, angry and armed to the teeth. Meanwhile, as the defenders in an urban combat environment, Ukraine enjoyed some significant advantages. Every building is a potential ambush point or sniper's nest. Russian troops on the ground had to exercise extreme caution or risk never returning home. Given that, blasting full speed toward government buildings might seem like a reasonable solution. But it is not that simple. Meet the Czech Hedgehog, the bane of advancing motorized troops everywhere. You may be most familiar with them from depictions of the Normandy invasion during D-Day, or as barricades in front of the Berlin Wall. However, their origin dates back to border fortifications that Czechoslovakia was developing in the 1930s, before the Munich Conference rendered them irrelevant. 
If a vehicle, tanks included, attempts to roll up to a hedgehog, the device is liable to lodge itself under the chassis and lift the vehicle off of the ground. At that point, the millions of dollars of hardware become easy pickings for the defenders. Attackers cannot blast their way through either because of the hedgehog's symmetric design. The hedgehog will roll over and continue to function as it used to. Hence the name. The Czech hedgehog is pointy and has the ability to spin. It's just a little less cute than the furry type. One of the two decent counter strategies is to move them yourself. And weighing roughly 200 kilograms, you'll probably want to go with a toe. But that is a risky play if you suspect that there are defenders in the area. The other option is to simply go around. That might work in an open field, but that strategy will not always present itself. Given Ukrainian geography, you will oftentimes find yourself wanting to cross a bridge, blocked by a healthy dose of hedgehogs. The detour alternative, for example, going north around the Kyiv Reservoir, might leave something to be desired. In urban settings, buildings often block that option as well. Thus, the only solution is to move the hedgehogs and pray you don't draw fire in the meantime. Moreover, they are exceedingly simple to make. They are just three I-beams welded together. As soon as the war began, welders across Ukraine quit what they were doing, found whatever scrap metal was lying around, and mass-produced hedgehogs. Of course, as more buildings were destroyed, more raw materials for I-beams suddenly became available. Consequently, Kyiv was absolutely flooded with them, and they are so durable that some were pulled out of World War II museums, still functional. Pockets of Russian soldiers did penetrate into the city, leading to some urban combat. The closest call occurred early on February 26th, when Russian invaders approached the Kyiv Zoo. Had they continued down Kyiv's main prospect, they were less than 7 kilometers driving distance to the presidential palace. Luckily for Ukraine, defending soldiers repelled the attack in time. And unless the Russian convoy could link up to any of these pockets, the isolated soldiers would be doomed to run out of supplies. Thus, Ukraine had conditionally checked 4 out of 5. Now it all came down to the convoy. Ukraine was given a bit of a head start here. Before leaving Belarus, Belarusian opposition engaged in a rail war, sabotaging train systems and limiting the fast movement of Russian supplies. But once the convoy crossed the border, Ukraine's strategy was all about climate and geography. Take a closer look at Ukraine from the air. Compared to the eastern plains, the area stretching from Belarus to Kyiv is heavily wooded. Although the plains are the inspiration for the Ukrainian flag, fighting on them provides few natural places to set up in ambush and wide open paths for attackers to take. If you want to catch your opponent off guard, your best hope is digging your own trench and praying that things will work out. In contrast, from the Russian perspective, the trees outside of Kyiv restrict the pathways that vehicles could take to escape. From the Ukrainian perspective, the tree cover provides an endless supply of locations from which to spring traps. And did they ever. Although described as 64 kilometers long, the convoy was not actually bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Instead, it was a series of groups spaced out over that distance. Ukraine's basic playbook was what we might call a pinch strategy. Soldiers would wait for a set of Russian vehicles to approach an ambush point. Then, through direct fire, drones, or otherwise, Ukrainian troops would immobilize the first and last vehicles in the group. This would trap all the remaining vehicles in between. Punching forward obviously was not an option, and the entire reason for taking out the last was to deny a reverse escape. That is where weather would come into play. By now, you have likely heard of the Rasputitsa mud that takes over Eastern Europe during rainy seasons. Russia had aimed to be clever by timing the invasion for the end of February. This was supposed to coincide with the peak freeze, the point of winter where cold temperatures have accumulated for long enough to freeze the ground and permit free travel to trucks and tanks. 
except the ground never froze that year. So with the first and last vehicle in a line immobilized, the only path of escape meant going off-road, and hoping the mud would be kind. And keep in mind that this guy was firing at you the entire time. If the mud was unkind, Russian soldiers would have to abandon their vehicles and run. This is how Ukraine recovered so many pieces of otherwise fully functional military equipment. Ukraine did a number of things to exploit this latent advantage. Czech hedgehogs could also block roads. Whereas buildings flank the hedgehogs in urban settings, here it was trees and the mud. Meanwhile, heading north of downtown Kyiv, Ukraine set up another series of solutions to deny Russia rapid entry into the most sensitive areas. These involved the Irpin River, flowing in this direction as a 162-kilometer tributary of the Dnipro. It provided a natural breakpoint, with Russia attacking from the left and Ukraine defending from the right. Ukraine's planners strengthened their hold by blowing key bridges that crossed the Irpin, like this one here. Russia's solution to the problem was to construct temporary pontoon bridges. However, those could require the vehicles to go off-road, and offered another opportunity for the mud to lock them down. But perhaps the height of the mud strategy was when Ukraine intentionally breached the Irpin River Dam, which caused water to flow back toward the river. That probably sounded incorrect, so let me explain. In the 1960s, as a part of infrastructure upgrades, the Soviet Union constructed the Kyiv Hydroelectric Power Plant, thereby damming the Dnipro River at the northern heart of the city. The water that filled in afterward became the Kyiv Reservoir, which covered a vast 922 square kilometers of territory. But this created an issue with the flow of the Irpin River, which fed into the reservoir from the west. Water in the reservoir pooled too far in that direction. As such, Soviet engineers built another dam there, and began pumping the Irpin up a few meters to flow into the reservoir. This turned the former wetlands to the west of the dam into an area suitable for agriculture. But the project also made it a valuable weapon for Ukraine 60 years later. When Ukraine released the dam, water flowed back toward the Irpin. The area west returned to its swampy state. Next to the dam, a two-kilometer river formed. 20 kilometers upstream were affected, and 25 square kilometers overall went underwater. Russia's existing pontoon bridges became worthless, the river having become too wide to cross. And places you could previously walk through now needed those bridges. Fringe areas became full-blown mudfests, deterring any tank or other vehicle from approaching. Elsewhere, the mud flowed onto the roadways themselves, just as in the classical illustrations from centuries past, giving the convoy no clear path forward. More generally, even without obstacles like mud or hedgehogs, having to stay on the road created a different problem for Russia. Military vehicles are far from lightweight objects, and while your average road can tolerate some level of military abuse, tank after truck after tank after truck is a different story. Once the road breaks, you're back to traversing dirt. Vehicle after vehicle digs deeper into the mud until you are back into the Rasputitsa situation. Remember Russia's optimistic assessments that troops would reach Kyiv in one day? Some units took a day just to get out of Belarus because the roads had been torn up so badly. From there, the time bomb began to go off. Vehicles ran out of fuel. Tires started popping. Poorly maintained engines refused to work. Russian soldiers had no idea where their next meal was coming from. And Russia's rigid command structure, combined with a lack of guidance from the beginning, left those soldiers aimless. By March 11th, the convoy had dispersed, no longer in a shape to conduct offensive operations. And five days later, the roles have reversed. Ukraine went on a counteroffensive, and Russia had to play defender. All told... Ukraine went 5-4-5. Five, five. The trophy Putin desperately sought would not be his. Not then, anyway. Ukraine had saved Kyiv.
Epilogue On March 29th, Russia announced a general intention to abandon the key front and redeploy its forces to the south and to the east. Although the declaration was met with skepticism in the west, Ukraine indeed retook all of its lost territory in the theater by April 4th. Russia described the entire offensive as a feint designed to distract Ukraine while the true offensives occurred in the south and in the east. However, feints are supposed to be low-cost, smoke-and-mirrors operations that distract your enemy and raise your popularity at home. This did not meet those standards. Rather, it was a series of logistical blunders that prevented Russia from achieving a quick victory in Ukraine and earning a champagne toast. And regarding the underlying intent, the position of potential replacement governments further cast doubt on the faint explanation. It did, however, provide convenient political cover for domestic Russian audiences who were unaware of all of the missteps made during the offensive. But the distraction aspect of it worked to some degree. Ukraine intentionally diverted resources to guarantee the capital's safety. The remainder of the country was a problem for later, with Ukraine hoping that Russia would overextend its supply lines and be vulnerable to a counterattack. It worked, but at a significant cost. Near Kyiv, in addition to all of the lives lost, the Irpin River Basin remains flooded today without a clear end in sight. To the east, Russia made substantial advances. Kherson City fell on March 2nd. By April 7th, Russian troops had occupied the eastern section of Kharkiv Oblast and continued to threaten the city. On May 20th, Russia captured Mariupol, thereby completing its Crimean land bridge. Ukraine's supposition may have been partially correct, though. Russia had overextended its supply lines. This allowed Ukraine to push Russia out of Kharkiv's vicinity in September. Following that, Ukraine forced Russia to retreat out of Kherson City without serious confrontation in November. But as of this recording, Russia maintains a firm control over the land bridge to Crimea, and there is no obvious end to the war in sight. If you want to know more about the invasion, you will love my book that examines the causes of it. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. Well, you made it to the end of the longest video I have ever produced. Finally, we can get to what I really want to talk about. Fonts. And with that, happy trails to Times New Roman. Long time the preferred font of the U.S. State Department, Secretary Blinken issued the cleverly titled memo, Times New Roman are a-changing, on February 6th shifting the department's preferred font to Calibri. Although I understand the benefits of saying goodbye to a serif font, I find Calibri to be basically the most boring possible option. Nevertheless, I appreciate Calibri's place in history, or lack thereof. In 2017, Pakistan pressed corruption charges against former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Part of his defense was a document allegedly drafted in 2006 not so beautifully typed out in Calibri. One slight problem. Calibri did not debut until 2007! Whoopsie!